So that's me. Uh, my name is Paul Bruce. I work for a company called SmartBear. We build software quality tools for the kinds of world. And since Steve can get away with using the moleskin, I'm going to too, because I rewrote this recently. Um, so I've been a developer for many years, but recently I switched over to, of all places, marketing, uh, because I found that there were multiple aspects of the software that we were shipping that you know, required more than just the developer mindset. Uh, so uh, I deal with things like strategic decisions now, uh, what goes into the product, what doesn't. I work with uh, awesome people like Ulla Lensmar, who 10 years ago thought up So Do I. Uh, if you've ever heard of that, uh, test soap services, and now we do rest services as well. Um, but mostly, I, I work to convey the value of our solutions. So just a little bit of reverse Q&A. This is going to be facetious here. Who likes to build stuff that works? It just works. All right. OK, so I'm talking to the right people. Um, also, uh, who thinks patterns and practices should get better over time? Oh, come on. Like who, oh, so you all think that patterns and practices should not get better over time. It comes and goes, right, in waves. Um, well, I ask that because who here uses or even knows what service virtualization is? Seriously? Is this a, okay. All right, so um, let me back up then. Uh, virtualization, we know what virtual machines are. They sit in the cloud, they're the full OS stack. Service virtualization, on the other hand, is part of that stack, is an OS typically, uh, like for instance, a uh, Docker container. Um, being able to start with a base of, of uh, already running software and then build on top of that. Uh, then also service virtualization itself, in its own right and space, is being able to spin up predominantly lightweight instances of something that aren't the real thing, not the full stack, but just the ephemeral out, outsides of the facade. So I would like to start this by a little story uh, based on lots and lots of conversations that I have with our customers, uh, prospects, other influencers. We don't have a lot of luxury in our business. We don't have the luxury of time. Uh, we also don't have the luxury of last minute complications. So if we're talking about three week sprints, the last thing you need is code change, like four days before you have to do a code freeze. Um, or, or even afterwards, you realize something's so bad that it's forgetting. We have to miss that sprint. We also uh, don't have the luxury of overly bureaucratic decisions. Things that take longer than three weeks or three months to come up with. And this is what I would say is that a lot of the service virtualization stack are these large scale enterprise uh, buy-ins. Uh, they're problematic in the sense that they don't meet our time to live when it comes to stuff like in my talk, changing it last minute, that's just a reflection of the fact that we live in a space, you have to change constantly. And we use the term at SmartBear, the connected world, um, just to describe the whole big mess. And it is a big mess. It's a big, messy distributed system that we're building today. And that's okay because, you know, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. But on the other hand, uh, this also leads to, even when done correctly, leads to a world that is rather complicated. I mean, I'm not going to speak in technical terms. There's no code that you're going to see here um, because there's plenty of other people who are way deep in it, uh, just like Steve and seeing Rust back at Glucon versus now uh, is, a, is an example there. And then also the connected world is crazy because it is constantly changing. And I mean constantly changing. I barely have enough time to find the messaging uh, to match the value that I'm trying to convey to them uh, through our products. So the good thing about APIs is that they really help us. That's great. They provide us a, a pretty uh, system agnostic way of the messaging back and forth. Um, they're a candy store for developers. So you can just pick and choose what you want. Uh, they're pretty cheap at this point. And they're also the same thing for businesses. So in other words, um, you know, a business can basically unplug and replug a value, prop, uh, a major value proposition. So if you're doing something uh, like, like, uh, well, I won't take the mail um, for, as an example, but things like geocoding. If your geocoding service is not holding up to your speed specifications, you can just replug and play it. So you really got to drive the, the true value of your API 
uh, and be different and be, uh, have differentiators there. But on the other hand, if you don't, it's very easy to just switch off. Um, so they really do help us make better business decisions. And also, they happen to be very lightweight. So the, you know, the IoT protocols that we're starting to get into with our product line, um, those like MQTT, super lightweight. I mean, compared to even REST, I'm surprised. I and mean, you can push whatever you want through that. But on the other hand, that's where we're going because we have devices that are so small that they can't handle XML. <laughs> so, um, so what I'd like to think about when it comes to APIs is that they have the same tenets as environmental friendliness, the reuse, reduce, recycle mentality. And that's how APIs can help us. They can help us reuse, of course, reuse logic, uh, reduce the amount of overhead uh, that we're actually delivering this data and then recycle that into another business model because obviously the product you're shipping today has to change for tomorrow. So of course you're going to be recycling your ideas and making them better over time. Um, on the other hand, APIs come with a lot of baggage, meaning that they're complicated to adopt and then actually train on. If you don't have proper descriptors, if you don't have documentation on that, it's just a potential surface, it's not actually a surface that people are going to address unless you have those documentations. And by descriptors, I mean, um, uh, where, where Steve just went, uh, Simon just went, uh, he talked about Swagger. That's what I'm talking about. API Blueprint, Ramble, Swagger. Um, then also, uh, they're kind of useless if you can't connect to them. So again, thanks to, Steve, uh, to Simon, he was able to express in a lot of different ways the space that I'm talking about when it comes to eventually when I talk about virtual APIs. Um, they, uh, when, when, you're connect, when you're disconnected from the network, when you're, for instance, a tester in Bangalore and you're trying to connect to the developer's code that you wrote, hi, I didn't even realize you were there. Um, what happens is you go through a VPN and the VPN is fleeting and now you can't test. End of story. Uh, you're on a plane, you're developing the front end, you're designing that front end, you can't connect up to that API. End of story. We don't like end of stories here, we like continuous integration and continuous delivery. So um, really, uh, that, that then goes to the fact that the APIs themselves, they, they are a little bit um, problematic, especially if uh, they are delivered through a, a, a front end or rely on a back end that is flaky itself. So they're really only as good as the stuff that they're in between, or sandwiched in between, for the final experience. This is what um, so everybody can see. This is what a broken API does to the user experience. Uh, for a designer, bad idea. All right, I didn't test that. Um, bad for a designer, bad for an end user. It just doesn't work. You're the weakest link in the chain. And that's the problem. Uh, so I talk to people who don't use descriptors a lot. There's a lot of developers on REST, especially around REST, and even more so on IoT stuff, where they don't even bother describing their service, which is fine if you're dealing with a one or two person team or a three or four person team. But as soon as you have to scale beyond that, um, you have to start thinking in terms of like how they say the hypermedia should actually be should convey those action principles, the same thing's true. You should be able to put out documentation and a description of the service, a machine readable description of the service, before you even begin. So your architects can use that in order to define and shape. Much like how you just said, it should be a, a mishmash of people kind of working together in the early stages to be able to design these APIs properly. And by properly, I kind of mean like APIs should be consumer based. You know, if you build in APIs that are like a data model in your database all over again, it's a good idea. Um, so it's about consumer-driven design. Um, I, I like to think of REST as a Zelda dungeon. Yeah, so there's the Zelda dungeon, um, which I spent way too much time in as a kid, um, but without a map and a compass. So imagine you don't know where you're going, and that's the problem with REST services that have no machine-readable description. Just don't know where you're going unless you have to talk to the developer, which is okay if you're just a shop of like a couple of devs literally sitting right next to each other. But then try to scale that out to testers in another country, or try to scale that out to, for instance, documentation. Like uh, we just supposed to meet up at Smart Bear Corporate from a couple of folks, a couple of guys doing Lucybot, 
which is an automatic uh, documentation process. So um, one of those things is you feed in your Swagger spec, and they'll produce not only uh, a documentation for it, like readable, actually, people documentation, they'll actually produce code examples for that, and visual renderings of, of elements that can be rendered like images and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff you can do if you start right, if you start with the correct kernel. Uh, and you know, in my title, I said devs and testers, best friends, really. Sometimes we're the same people. It's just different hats. Um, in developer mode, I would say you know, it makes sense to focus on code and certainly unit testing. On the other hand, in task mode, you focus on essentially uh, stuff that is not code. In fact, some of the best testing done by testers that I've experienced is when they purposely say, I will not touch code. I will not think about this as a coding challenge. So unit testing is, is definitely great. Um, but then going beyond that, starting to talk about usability testing or integration testing, um, you want to think about that as not a code challenge. Ultimately, uh, you know, I have this, I have this here, uh, code first is an unsustainable methodology. Code first testing. It's great at the unit level. But when it comes to those other paradigms that maybe you have to shift off to other people after a while, you know, maybe this is a startup and it's great that you're shipping that way, but then you know, a couple months from now, you know you're going to have an outsourced testing team. Then by all means, you know, thinking first uh, mean, uh, renders code as the test somewhat unsustainable to the rest of your growth block. And by all means, I mean growth. Isn't that the point of all of this? Uh, so, what I'm talking about here is people that can do multiple roles and, and, and do that, but the problem is it's hard to find those people. It's hard to find people that have, again, the time to do all the things, develop code, and also do all their unit testing and also do uh, integration testing and whatnot. Uh, it's difficult to find and retain those folks. It's also difficult to uh, expect a fair degree of separation of concern. Uh, of concern. So there should be a separation of concern when it comes to the person producing the code, as well as somebody outside of that space testing it. So I just talked about the fact that kind of you have to do both. You have to allow for different people to test them to develop, and then sometimes you don't have that luxury. Um, either way, separation of concern between uh, developing and testing is something that you should always keep in your the forefront of your mind. Uh, but ultimately, when it comes down to it, you're talking about deadlines. You're talking about the developers getting code to essentially a freeze point or completing sprint uh, in time. And then you're also talking about testers uh, being able to complete that with that separation of concern. And it's hard when you're talking about one person doing both of those tasks, even if they try to do it well, it really boils down to, am I going to spend time writing good code or better code, fixing bugs before it goes out, or writing tests or building tests out in a pragmatic fashion? So you literally uh, end up in a place where people are often have to do the trade-off. Um, so I work for a testing company. <laughs> so what I would really say is please, please, please test your code. Oh, for the love of please test your code. Um, and by, by that I mean the developers should do unit tests, absolutely. Um, but, but I would say, and I, I said this last year at Lucon, pair review, not Lucon, APS strap, pair review. So there's pair programming, and it's also peer review at the same time. And if you are a stack of developers, uh, not necessarily primarily like testers involved, then of course you need to be able to uh, quickly slide over and say, hey, would you test this for me? So I just wrote this, you test this, I'll test yours, and you know, show me your API and I'll show you mine. I've read two different people. Because honestly, a developer, I don't know about you guys, but like as a developer, I don't want to be writing tests. I want to be like building this stuff, not like, making sure that it works. And vice versa, sometimes people just don't, they don't like code, that's why they're testers. You know, they like the technology process, they like to be involved, but you know, writing code all day makes them miserable. So in that sense, um, having different personalities involved is, is almost a good thing. Uh, ultimately though, it, it, separating this out to different people, it allows the business to make good decisions. As in, where do we put this effort? Um, who do we get involved? Who do we allow to do the thing that they do the best? Uh, and so the developers can focus on writing awesome code and making uh, architecture decisions. 
And then the testers can focus on you know, providing us information concern and, and that mentality, that proper mentality of both, um, like for instance, security testing and the white hat testing. Uh, they can move on in their levels of excellence when it comes to what they do best. So that's why I kind of think that um, what I hear from customers is constantly like mostly test groups is that they're kind of frustrated the way that they work with developers for whatever reason. Um, I know as a developer I have a small bit of an ego. Um, I've seen that before again as well. But when it comes to testers, we don't have the luxury for egos because constantly, um, especially with a few of our customers, I can't think of um, they, they often get into this, you know, uh, the developers will say you broke my code. <laughs> as if to say that like testing something and then it doesn't work the way it's said. Is, is somebody else doing the problem as opposed to there was a problem with the code? And then the testers also say, you know, you make me late because you have to fix the bug before we ship it. And so now I have to retest it at 12.30 at night, wherever I am, that, no matter where you are, 12.30 at night kind of things. Um, there's also the we mentality as well. If, if, if they're enlightened enough to have a holistic mindset, it's still, we rolled something that was broken. Oops, that's a big deal because now we're literally bleeding revenue and we're losing customers. So, you know, when it, when it comes to the, the problems between teams, I think it's mostly just stress, what you're put under, and, um, and we do this over and over again. So teams will constantly get into this battle, and it will drag down their morale. So that's why I say, rather than that, I'm looking for ways to get teams, uh, separate teams, and, the, and then also if you're a developer and you, you have to do all your testing, like, that's a stress point itself. So I'm looking for ways to resolve that stress. And thankfully, Simon covered a lot of the space that I'm going to talk about, which is essentially the big problem here is time. Time, time. We have no time anymore to do all the stuff that we have to do. Uh, we also have problems with our staff, uh, the servers that are involved, the configuration, and then also um, things like versioning. Like you said, uh, if, if the version changes, now all of a sudden my tests have to change as well. We also have a problem of control. Who controls the stack that you're testing? You know, even if it's a virtual stack for the, the training group, or for the staging group, again, it's operations who control staging. It's developers who roll the next version of the staging from, uh, from some kind of QA environment, from some kind of developer. So either way, the control, who gets the control over when this happens and how this happens, is also a problem too. Now you're incorporating too many people. So what if what if the API didn't exist? It's like there is no spoon. Right? Let's just stop for a second and think about what happens when you don't actually have an API to test on. Because on the train, and I don't know, uh, this is a far off place from where I live. I live in Boston, and we had some massive snow problems, and the trains were down for like two months. It was awful. Uh, but even when the trains are running well, they're wireless sucks. So, like, what happens when you don't have an API? Uh, what would it take to actually allow people to test and to develop without necessarily the full stack API running somewhere that they can connect to? Well, of course, you want to simulate the minimum behavior of that system. And by minimum, I actually mean start with nothing and build up from there instead of start with everything, which everything I mean like the whole OS, the code relate on to that, then all the backend systems behind that, that can be a pretty big step, not just one server. So um, you start from a minimum instead of starting with everything and then working your way down. And uh, like I said earlier, in reality, uh, with virtual APIs, or uh, something called the fake APIs, it's a matter of giving people um, something that has been modeled based on the consumer that's going to be modeling it, whether that's the designer of a front end, a mobile app, or whether that's another API, or some kind of code in the cloud that's actually relying on your API. That's the, that's the design practice that uh, I think a lot of people are starting to move to, to accept just like de facto. So this is what it looks like with a virtual API. I will not stand next to the thing again. But, Without that big red X, now a virtual API can stand in for that minimum behavior and allow people to still be able to test their front ends and other APIs for that matter. 
So Simon did a good job describing mocks and how that could help, but in reality, mocks, uh, from practice and experience, they're still just code. So what you're doing is you're building more code on top of code to solve a problem, which actually becomes hard to sustain if you are a tester that does not know the code. So you have to go back to the developers and say, I need, I need some data pushed into this, I need the static content to be changed. And that becomes a problem. And then if you want to roll that to a whole number of people, like let's say you take one of those testers and you say, no, go offline, you should have this stack set up on your machine and you can test this independently, literally without a network connection. Well, again, that becomes problematic. So, um, you know, obviously code is, is a heavy solution when it comes to simulating the behavior of an API. And then also redeployment is cumbersome when there's changes and you have to redeploy them to, you know, how many machines are out there for testers doing tests. But then, of course, when you want to build shareable, dynamic mocks, you're kind of left in the lurch right now. And that's where Smarter came in and, and started working on this idea of virtual APIs. Um, we don't want developer time to be lost, and not just time, but also opportunity cost. If they're focusing on writing mock code, and they're not focusing on writing like innovative stuff. And then, of course, um, when it comes to virtual APIs, uh, this is to, to build out the scale of where you can go with this thing. So when they grow up, they can uh, scale to team skills. So again, you don't have to have that, that senior developer to maintain that lock. Uh, then also the roles, you can separate out that role, maybe just one developer help a team of testers deal with the locks. Uh, or verts, as we call them. And then, of course, this scales out to different testing paradigms, like uh, like performance testing, and then also integration testing. So you can actually use these things, like you said. Um, you can use these things to isolate problems and also to diagnose things quickly. So in the case where we had this guy, I know that since my virtual API is on a server that just it, it kills it, that it's super lightweight and it doesn't actually introduce any performance problems, now I can focus on the performance problems of the other parts of my code. I can isolate down, almost, almost methodically, uh, what to, to focus my performance tests or my integration tests on. Okay, so uh, just to be fair, what birds aren't? Uh, where will they not help you? Well, if you've got really small teams, then of course you might as well just work like that. You're probably in an office, working online, connected most of the time. Uh, then also, if you're confident in your homegrown solution, absolutely. Feel free. Um, I was talking to one of the folks from Rackspace uh, in Berlin, and he said, "Well, we do all of our own mocking stuff, and we use that for simulation. And, you know, we have some really high performance requirements on that. Good, go for it. But on the other hand, for those of us who don't have the luxury of writing our own mocking framework from scratch or using, writing into a mocking framework and taking time to do that, that's where it comes in. If you really need full stack testing, like if you really need to test the entire stack and make sure that the performance is right there, like uh, a staging server, then of course virtual APIs aren't necessarily helpful in that case. And yes, I work for SmartBear, and I mean it. I would not know this kind of stuff if I, did, I wasn't required to do a deep dive on virtual APIs. And we kind of think that um, your time and your intelligence is worth the whatever cost um, for the for whatever kind of product that you do, like like uh, some of the products you wipe up, uh, stuff that we sell. That focusing on the stuff that that you do better, um, that's that's much more worth your time. And I think you should too. I think you should think that too. Um, but ultimately, if you want to know more, you can find me and talk more. Um, and I disagree. I think Ready API is actually one of the best tools for that. So. Um, what does the landscape look like with, oh, yes, that's ready again. I want you to take that one a little bit. Um, the sky's the limit when it comes to the landscape of what it looks like with virtual APIs. Uh, design and developers and testers can start at the same time. Meaning if you start with a swagger spec and you allow your developers to start building their APIs on that and build out a virtual API, stand up, we make it very easy to stand up, um, a virtual API from a Swagger spec. Your architect can do that. You turn around and create a virtual API instantaneously. And then you can fill out what's necessary in order to complete that process. And now the designer has something to go on. If they want to mock out um, fake data, they can do that through the vert. The point being here is that um, this does stuff your business. It cuts down the overall cost. It 
because you're no longer spending your developer time and salary and resources on that, and you're not losing opportunity, and then also it allows people to work independently uh, so that they can not only work offline or online, it's not about that, it's more about being able to satisfy your goals for that day, ship out the tests that you have, uh, that you're responsible for, and then ultimately gives you back control over the data that you are pushing through that virtual API. If somebody can slam in there and say, talking to a developer, they can slam in there and change the dynamic data to prove that their test fails when it's supposed to fail. <coughs> when their front end does, has a problem when it's supposed to have a problem. Like if the API returns some junk data, a third party API returns some junk data, you should be able to handle that rather than a big like 500 error or, or some lost front end experience. And also when it comes to performance, like you said before, uh, Simon mentioned about the rate limits. Yeah, I don't want to take money away from you know, our competitors, I kind of do. I kind of think that you should, if you run a load test uh, and you've got a third party involved and you don't want a massive bill at the end of the month, you should use your virtual API to simulate that, ex that part of the experience. Save yourself a lot of time and money and then do one, coordinate with them. You might even consider your denial of service if you do this for Google Analytics or you do this for Keen IO. Don't consider your DOS just by running a load test. So it gives you back control over the scope of your testing. So we live in the future here. Um, there's more to virtualization, uh, specifically service virtualization, than obviously what I've talked about right now. Um, we currently see this as virtual machines and service virtualization, but again, virtual APIs, the way that Smarter does them, are yet another step past that. It's the lightweight, the minimum starting from the minimum and moving to what you need. Uh, it's also kind of, uh, it's kind of like envisioning math without fractions or decimals. Uh, the, the more fine grain you can get, the more options you can provide people, the better kind of output you can get. So while we've got virtual machines, which are like whole numbers, now virtual APIs are kind of like the fractions in between that allow you to get more fine grain and more uh, flexibility over your process. Oh, um, yeah, if you, want to, if you want to talk to me about what I think we would like to move to in service virtualization, uh, come see me afterwards because there's things like AV testing, and traffic shaping, and rerouting, uh, but I don't want to step on anybody's toes who are also vendors here. Um, so my, my point here is please, please focus on stuff that's not already been solved as you have been doing, but sometimes it can creep in. Mocks are a perfect example. We think it's a good idea. It is a good idea for a developer. But then when you scale it up to the team, it becomes a hard thing to perpetuate in, that, in your business model. And so we stand on the shoulders of giants. So you know the whole point of APIs is to reuse other people's work because that's what they do best. Do that same thing and, and don't get stuck in, in the land of mocks just because you had to get something done. There's better ways to do that. And then this, this is my last space. Please, let's, let's just get together and build really great software. It is a we thing. Uh, SmartBear just recently kind of uh, took, took the stewardship over of Swagger to make sure that the big businesses um, aren't, aren't making bad decisions. And one of the things there is that, of course, we're a tool company, but we also see that it's a we thing. It's not a product that we sell. It's, it's a we thing. It's a product that we have all built uh, and made sure satisfies specific goals. So now when it comes to the tool business, um, we also build tools that make sure that you can satisfy very specific goals in a reasonable amount of time with, with a little cost here. And uh, of course, there's plenty of competition, and that's a good thing. So uh, like he had a list of, of different like mockable um, services, that's great. Um, I would encourage you to try those out, and then also try out the stuff the smart comes out. So uh, talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you.